Yeah, I will use the name. Here we go. Okay, who's speaking first? Um, I. Who's talking first? Yeah. You? Which one? Is that an on-off button? It's an on-off button. Oh, and it's just... Okay. Mm -hmm. And also this one. Let's see, uh, this I'm just going to use. Um, so you do this one? Okay. Until when? Until here. Shoot, I need to go to the bathroom. And then. Yeah. I cannot move. And then. Oh. <laughs> and then. Do you want to? Camera's first. I am. And then, where do I go? And we can have a conversation. Do you want the water? Hmm? Okay. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Max Donath, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, our uh, continuing weekly series on advanced transportation technologies. Uh, we have some two interesting speakers today that are going to share the podium, uh, but before I introduce them, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Kylie Gibbons, who's going to take care of some housekeeping and be distributing uh, some course evaluations to the students who are registered for the seminar course. Hi, thank you for coming by today. Um, welcome to the seminar series uh, called the Advanced Transportation Technology Seminar. It's sponsored by the Roadway Safety Institute. Uh, for our live audience, please know that we do have a remote audience uh, streaming live. So we are using a microphone, so if you do have questions, please save them to the end, and please wait until we can hand you the microphone so we can, uh, so the live or the remote audience can hear you. Uh, today's seminar will be streaming live through the web via YouTube Live. So for our remote viewers, please uh, put any of your questions into the chat box, as well as sign into the chat box with your name, your agency, as well as how many viewers you have, because we do report our viewership to the USDOT, so that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and please note also there's a 30 second lag for our remote viewers, so uh, any questions that you do have, may take an extra minute for us to get to. But uh, with that, please um, help me welcome our speakers. Uh, let me introduce our two speakers who will be talking on assessing roadway safety risks in American Indian reservations. Uh, uh, we're very fortunate uh, this year uh, to be looking at uh, the safety problems on uh, tribal reservations and uh, we have two uh, of our key researchers exploring this area who will be talking about what their experiences are in this research. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Guillermo Narvaz, uh, and uh, he has a PhD in, uh, in um, anthropology, uh, which is rather interesting. Um, he got his PhD at the University of California, Irvine, and has had uh, quite extensive experience uh, in the computer industry uh, because he first started off as an electrical engineer who went back to get a PhD in anthropology. Our other speaker is Kathy Quick. Uh, she's a faculty member in the uh, Humphrey School of Public Policy. 
Uh, Kathy Quick also has a PhD uh, from UC Irvine in public policy and design. Um, more details can be found on the website. So without further ado, we're going to start with uh, uh, Dr. Narvaz, who's going to talk about uh, his spin on this particular project. <laughs> Hello. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Is this a good place to be? Um, again, just to repeat a little bit of who we are, uh, these, uh, we're both uh, co-PIs for this project. And uh, the reason we're kind of focusing a little bit on the disciplinary aspects of, on our backgrounds and stuff is because we believe that these questions can be best answered by a multidisciplinary approach, especially considering, you know, social science aspects, you know, and the, uh, because of the nature of the problem is, uh, is it, it, it's, you know, it spans many uh, uh, domains, and thus it can be understood by, through many disciplines, right? Um, we, this is just to give us a guidance about the direction in which the talk is going to go. We're dividing this talk in several sections that we will be handing off between each other. Um, we started this because, um, it, we're focusing on, on tribal transportation uh, uh, safety issues because uh, there has been uh, a concern that there is high rates of, um, uh, of um, uh, moving vehicle, uh, motor vehicle fatalities and injuries among uh, American Indians, right? And we can see here a list of, uh, selected list of some of the literature indicating that um, the rates are higher for this ethnic group than for other ethnic groups. So we examine, we're beginning to examine why this is so, right? And also we're trying to understand uh, measures that have been taken or can be taken to reduce these. And we'll be exploring these um, throughout this talk, right? We jumped suddenly. Well, I'll just give you, this is, an early indication, it, it, this is just to give you one of the measurements that we see of concern, right? In 2011, for uh, young drivers, which are a high risk group uh, to begin with, um, we see that uh, uh, the rates, you know, the total rates uh, are more or less even for most um, ethnic groups, Asian and Pacific Islander, for some reason is very low, but it mainly has to do with a percentage of that ethnic group living in areas that don't have extensive road systems. But then we do see that for American Indians and Alaska Natives, it's unusually high. I would like to turn the rest of this part to Professor Quick, who will examine this data in more detail. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this. Um, as Guillermo was mentioning, there's something really exceptional and extraordinary about what's happening in this population, which has drawn a lot of attention, not only from transportation safety researchers, but also from people who are working on public policy and in tribal as well as state, county, and federal government agencies that are looking at transportation safety in general. And so we're really trying to get a little bit of better handle on what it is that's been going on. Um, there are a number of explanations for this phenomena in the existing published research, of which there has not been a lot, um, but there are some commonly found explanations, basically of four types, which align in a lot of ways with what people often describe as the four E's of transportation safety, which I'm sure that anybody who's been coming to the Roadway Safety Institute um, discussions is already familiar with. But there are a couple of different kinds of explanations that we find in the literature. One of them is really about individual behaviors that maybe this elevated level of fatalities and severe injuries among American Indians has to do with individual driving behaviors from impaired driving, for dr from drunk or drugged driving, um, also from low rates of safety restraint use, either the use or the proper use of seat belts and child um, safety seats, and also from speeding. But there's another set of explanations that we also find in the literature, um, and by the way, we do have a, a literature review um, on this that we'd be happy to share with anybody who's interested in seeing these particular references. Um, around road conditions. And that has to do really with the quality of the roads in rural areas in general, the fact that many reservation roads 
are um, unpaved, that they are in rural areas, that the signage is poor, lighting is poor, there's vegetation, et cetera. Um, however, there's another set of explanations that really relate more specifically to the tribal um, condition in particular, and that has to do with historic and structural disparities that affect American Indian communities in general. So naturally, um, the rates of fatalities and severe injuries among American Indians are not, um, are not completely dissociated from other sorts of health disparities and socioeconomic conditions um, that this population faces, including unmet health needs, which may be complicating um, their health as they're out on the roadways, either as pedestrians or as walking, poverty and things like the quality of the vehicles that people are driving, or simply the longer distances that people must travel in order to be able to access places of work, places of, um, for education, and other um, kinds of things. And then finally, there are also some issues around institutional resources and policies, um, that there are enforcement issues and there are some conflicts perhaps that complicate this whole situation relating to the very complex web of jurisdictions that intersect around reservation boundaries. And we'll talk a little bit about more that about that in a moment. So why um, the distinction on reservations? The statistics that we just shared with you are for the American population of American Indians as a whole. So why would we focus on reservations? Part of it is that although um, many of you may already know this, but many people are surprised to find, I don't know what, no what percentage of the American Indian population you imagine live on reservations, but in fact it is about 22% of all American Indians. Um, people who identify either uh, completely or are in some part as American Indian or Alaskan Native, only 22% of them live on reservations. There is a high concentration of people who identify as American Indian who also live in counties that are adjacent to reservations, but there's also a very high urban population and suburban population of American Indian people. So this is not, by focusing on reservations, we're certainly not getting necessarily to an entire explanation for what it is that might be going on, but it does help us to focus our attention on roadways and on these jurisdictional issues that have to do with tribal government um, and what specifically might be happening on reservations. However, we do have a question here, an open question, because there has been so little research done on this so far, about what whether what's happening with American Indian safety is really any different in reservations than it might be from rural conditions more generally in the United States. And as you can see from these statistics, in the U.S. as a whole, approximately 54% of all motor vehicle crash deaths by um, in 2013, 54% of them were in rural areas. So there is sort of a disproportionate number of these um, very severe accidents that happen in those areas. And that's true in Minnesota even to a de greater degree, 66%. And so one of the questions we have here is whether, is there anything specifically happening in reservations or is this really um, a, a broader rural issue? So there are some things that we can see from existing data around crashes um, from federal and state data. The standard practice to look at crash statistics would be to look at this kind of data that's been submitted by enforcement agencies to state and federal agencies. That is obviously very valuable data on what has happened, but it also depends on what has been reported. And there are certainly issues um, within the area of tribal government in general around what it is that people are and are not obliged and prepared and wanting to share with these other agencies because of issues of tribal sovereignty, long histories of relationships, of distrust, of abuse of information to some degree that has been detrimental to tribal communities. There are some concerns about sharing data. There are also simply capacity issues around um, the, the ability that tribal governments have to easily upload and be able to share some of this data. So we are, of course, looking at these data sources, um, but they are incomplete in terms of representing the scale of this problem. Um, on the left, you see what is reported in the Minnesota state uh, system, and on the right, you see what's reported in, in the federal system on fatalities. Um, and really, one of the uh, objectives of our research project is to identify some new sources of data and some new um, ways to analyze it. So just to summarize kind of the, the thrust of this contribution or what distinguishes it from other research, um, the existing literature is fairly limited. As I said, um, there are only about 20 to 25 peer-reviewed studies. Most of them have been done at a national level. Most of them have been done using epidemiological studies, statistically looking at kind of the incidence. Um, and that has pointed to this elevated rate, but it does not provide us with a very comprehensive explanation of what might be going on. 
and there isn't really any differentiation between urban, rural, or reservation-based populations. And so we're really trying to drill down on that with what you see in the second column here of situated qualitative and collaboratively produced data in which we're really trying to pay more attention to the contextual conditions in particular areas to probe whether there is a distinction in Minnesota, at least between uh, reservation and non-reservation rural areas, but also to be inclusive um, in our cooperation with American Indian communities. So the approach of this project is a collaboration with tribal governments to interpret reservations road safety risks. We're focusing on people's knowledge on the ground as a policy scientist and as a policy professional previously. It's my strong belief that not only does science have a, a, a strong place in advising policy, but that you need to speak with policymakers on the ground in order to be able to come up with pragmatic and implementable solutions. So we've really put a premium on gathering data from the knowledge of people on the ground ab about what's happening. We're exploring their explanations of what the nature of the risk is and what kinds of improvements they would recommend. We're also trying to draw out success stories, and a large part of this project is to build and sustain relationships with tribal governments, um, which has been an important kind of long-term effort that we're engaging in. So our research questions in this project are how do stakeholders in the context interpret and manage roadway safety risks? How do they explain that risk? Um, what are some of their stories about the causes and the effects and what's distinctive about reservations? We also look at what are those patterns of divergence and convergence in different people's accounts. And in a minute, we'll share with you who some of those stakeholders are that we're getting, trying to get these triangulated views. And then, of course, our central question also is what do we do to improve roadway safety? This is not just an academic exercise, but also has a strong intention of trying to inform policy to improve safety. Um, we also ask how tribal governance, sovereignty, and intergovernmental relationships improve and impact roadway safety and reservations, and that turns out to be a very important part of this story. And we've also been looking at the kind of methodological innovations that we can contribute. We were asked some time ago by the leader, by one of the leaders of the Tribal Transportation Program federally, whether there was a technology transfer piece that doesn't look like a lot of other engineering transportation transfers, but if there was a methodological transfer that we could do in developing some of these tools and instruments that tribal governments might themselves use um, to do their investigations locally. So we're gonna talk a little bit about those methods innovations. The thing that we did is, hello. <laughs> um, basically, by innovation of methods, it means that uh, we are applying methods that have been used in social sciences for a while in other fields and looking at things like public health, uh, land tenure, et cetera, and, and both within the United States and externally. But let me give you some context uh, of the study areas where we are. So we began by um, um, uh, contacting the Advocacy Council on Tribal Transportation. Minnesota has a unique arrangement in that uh, because of um, executive order by the governor, uh, Governor Dayton, to better engage with tribal governments, there is an ongoing um, uh, uh, relationship, dialogue with the uh, 11 tribal governments at the state level to discuss issues um, uh, in the case of transportation to coordinate transportation issues between the Minnesota Department of Transportation and other agencies and the 11 uh, tribal governments. That organization is called the Advocacy Council on Tribal Transportation. And with them, we began exploring the nature of the work that we were going to do, right? We also uh, carried out um, a review of uh, crash data, both uh, state, federal sources. The principal ones that come are the Minnesota uh, crash uh, CMAT, the Minnesota uh, crash, uh, anyway, the, the, the state level uh, crash reporting system, and also the uh, federal data sources, such as uh, US DOT and FH, uh, federal highways uh, 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 fatality and accident reporting system, FARS, which is often referred to. And uh, we've also looked at CDC data and also uh, insurance data to try to understand the differences in how, uh, and, and other health 
uh, uh, sources to like Indian Health Services and such, but to try to understand how uh, uh, the injuries and the fatalities get reported, right? Um, we so in that review of data, we try to see what gaps exist, you know, and uh, we're trying to see if there are ways that we can fill those or better understand uh, why the data differs for the different uh, different uh, uh, databases significantly, right? Um, this is actually a little old. I think we've actually visited most of the 11 uh, uh, tribal governments. We've had uh, um, both um, extensive interviews and also conversations with most of the 11, I think all 11, at least 10 of the 11 uh, tribal governments. Um, and uh, we begun and continue to uh, carry out extensive interviews with uh, people of the federal, state, and county governments, townships, right, that are involved in um, uh, cities and townships that are in proximity or interact with the different tribal governments. And we've uh, established relationships with other researchers who are looking at these questions, right? So, of course, working with, in, in these uh, rural locations uh, takes time and uh, it takes time. There's no qu a quick way to do it. So we selected uh, four tribal governments to work with. And by selecting, uh, I want to explain there is more of a process of arriving at a collaborative agreement. We're working with them, right? And in close consultation to um, um, uh, try to understand how, um, transportation safety, you know, uh, what the issues are in the different reservations. In some ways, we can look at all 11 reservations, right? We can see something that in the northern part of the state, they are larger, they have a larger land mass than in the southern part of the state where they are uh, very small. Most of the work that we're doing, uh, we initially started with Red Lake, then uh, we started working with Fond du Lac, Leech Lake, and uh, lastly, um, we've done, uh, we began working with Millax. We might expand this work. Just by looking at a map like this, they all look very, very similar. But actually, as you begin getting in, we see that they differ significantly one from the other and kind of gives us an opening to the nature of the problem, why data collection is, uh, or the data that we're finding is a bit um, uh, uneven and stuff. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to do is to extend the data that is available through crash and uh, accident and fatality reporting systems. And we tried to go more to a community mapping model where we're asking different stakeholders and members of the community about what concerns them about the roads. Everyone has an opinion about the roads, right? <laughs> Just think about it in the morning, you know, if they don't plow your, your road properly, you have an opinion. So we're trying to collect this to see if patterns emerge. And sometimes it involves uh, talking, in this case, talking with bus drivers about their reservation, right? And they're telling us things like, oh yeah, this, this intersection, uh, we just put post-its on the map indicating different issues that they have about the roads that they drive in regularly. We do this with one person, we get an impression. We do this with 70 plus people, we, we see patterns, right? And that's what we're trying to do. So these are informal interviews or what initially we called virtual tours, right? It would be nice to go out with the drivers on, uh, uh, on the routes, but that is very um, time consuming and extended. Uh, so instead what we have done is uh, taking these virtual drives with these maps with expert drivers, which on the, on the surface, initially we started talking with road maintenance, police department, fire. We need to talk with them a bit more. The two times that I tried to talk with the fire department, they had to go do their jobs. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> um, uh, but there are other stakeholders that are quite amazing uh, uh, fonts of information. Uh, sanitation drivers, propane uh, delivery, 
uh, school bus drivers, eh, that's a given, and transit drivers, but also nurses that do home visits because these are people that have to use the roads year-round under every weather conditions day and night. They've been incredible sources of information. Um, we are recording the, uh, this information, you know, by, by jotting down notes, making recordings and stuff. But we also have these quick interactions with members of the public during community events, health fairs, powwows, etc. We've also gone out and observed the, the areas that they have mentioned that are of concern to them, right? And uh, taken pictures, and we're beginning to map these, right? Let's see, uh, it pretty much gives you an idea over here of the kind of stakeholders that we've been interviewing, and I'm not going to go through the whole list, but you can see that it's a pretty diverse group. I mean, oh, I forgot to mention, casino shuttle drivers. Yep, they're an important group, <laughs> right? So um, some of the uh, questions that we've been asking is, uh, some of the basic ones, how are you involved in the reservation? Not everyone lives on the reservation who works at the reservation, or many people who live in the reservation drive out of the reservation to go to work and stuff, right? So we all are also concerned about the roads that they drive that are not specifically within the reservation because they affect the community, right? Uh, and then we get their impressions about what they feel about the conditions of the roads, what do you think are the major sources of risk, what do you think should be done to improve? We're basically getting community input, right? But um, by then selecting different stakeholders, that everyone's, everyone's impression is very important, of course. But what the police department and what the road maintenance people tell us is different from what a parent tells us about taking their kids to school, even though they're both uh, greatly concerned about getting back and forth safely, right? Um, this, um, this is a list of uh, questions, a sample of the questions that we're asking, and a sample of the responses that we're getting, right? Um, and uh, things are coming, so we call it new kinds of data uh, through these exercises, and in these pictures, you can see some of the places where we've been interacting with people uh, in the community. These two are two different health fairs um, at different reservations, right? And we've had these interactions with people that can be as short as a minute, and sometimes I've ended up uh, talking with some members of the community for half an hour or more, right? Um, and to go back again, the kind of questions we've been asking is uh, uh, the ones that you can see over here, and something that comes up over and over again, which we didn't um, think as deeply about it when we started this work is uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety. That's a great concern, right? Uh, other issues also come up. People complain that people don't wear seat belts, that they don't put their kids in the proper car seats, etc. But um, we're also trying to differentiate, well, we'll get into the analysis of that a little bit later. Um, and then we are trying to elicit from the conversations that we have things like uh, time of day, you know, um, environmental conditions, conditions of the roads, etc. We're trying to look for patterns. This also gives you, these two pictures give you a little bit more detail of how we are gathering data and the places that we're gathering. Sometimes it's even outside. Uh, <laughs> in the middle of the summer, which makes for very short interactions. This is a sample of one of the maps that uh, we collected information from members of the public, right? Then what, what I meant before is that we are looking for patterns because then we're taking maps like this, you know, we're taking 30, 40, 50 maps like this and combining them and see what kind of patterns emerge. I mean, and then you can see sort of, it, 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 you cannot just dismiss it as anecdotal or hearsay, but you can see that when you see patterns, then that kind of gives weight to the information that we're getting. Um, to expand a bit more on the results, uh, Kathy Quick will take it from here. Professor Quick. Is, that, is this on? Okay, good. All right, so would you like to hear about some results? 
One of the reasons that we talked about the methods at some length is because uh, it's been complicated to develop the methods for this, um, to be able to try to elicit some new kinds of data um, and to build these relationships and to test them out and try the methods. Um, also to have the methods be some large part of the contribution of this project um, so that other people can use them to address this issue. But we will share with you some preliminary results. And I know I just gave you a teaser about results, um, but I do have to first insert a caveat. One is that these are definitely preliminary results. Um, we have just completed 75 days of um, field work time on the ground between the three of us, and the three of us would be Guillermo and myself. And I also want to thank Victoria Fiorentino, who's um, a uh, graduate research assistant who's begun working with us um, in the Humphrey School and who uh, got to go out with us to Millilox a few weeks ago. So we are still sort of in the weeds on analyzing that data. We've had a lot of time um, in these four reservations. And it took about 15 months first to lay the groundwork and to build relationships before we began actually to even be able to be on site in the reservation. However, at this point, um, we've done, uh, actually I just did two more this morning, so 95 key informant interviews, um, and we've also had 202 shorter interactions with members of the general public gathering data um, with these four tribal governments as our uh, partners, and we've done, we've had thousands of miles on the road. So we are really still walking and wading through this uh, big collection of data that we did um, over the summertime. In addition, however, the more important thing is that because of the collaborative relationships that we have with tribal governments, because of some requirements of the university's institutional review board on collaboration with tribal governments, and frankly, because of our own kind of ethics of engagement with them, um, we have a commitment to the tribal governments to not share detailed aspects of the data collection and analysis from their particular reservation communities until they have had a chance to review that. So what I want to share with you today is some sort of general things that are outstanding from the data that we've already been able to look at. One of them is this question that I highlighted at the beginning about whether there is really anything specific about a reservation context as opposed to a rural context more generally. And I would say that at this point, it is not clear that roadway safety issues on reservations are really distinctively different from other rural safety issues. The same concerns that we hear about drunk or drugged driving about icy conditions, dark conditions, poor lighting, curvy roads, deer on the roads. There's not anything specific about reservations that would distinguish that from other rural areas of Minnesota, nor is there something really distinctively different in the road engineering. Partly because, as I'll return to in a minute, um, this is such a complex web of jurisdictional um, overlapping that most of the roads and reservations are not reservation roads. They're not BIA roads. They're not Bureau of Indian Affairs roads. They are the same county, state, or township roads that you would find in and outside the reservation. There are two exceptions to this, though, that do really make reservations stand out in a particular way. One is that extremely heightened concerns about pedestrian safety for a number of reasons. There are lots of people who are moving on the roads in reservations by choice or by necessity. Um, there, is, there are important cultural traditions about moving around on foot from one village to another. There are also economic circumstances that make it harder for people to have their own reliable transportation that they can use to get around. So there are just lots of people moving on roads. And in addition, um, even though this is a rural area, very often the, the housing in reservation areas is quite concentrated, and so you have large numbers of people um, moving on the roadway in small um, areas of the, the space. And there are real concerns about outsiders in particular who are passing through these areas not being prepared, not expecting to find so many pedestrians on the road in what looks like a rural area that they're familiar with where with they wouldn't anticipate that. And so um, a lot of the concerns about the safety of people on the roads and reservations actually have to do with pedestrians and bicyclists and also with um, outsiders who are not familiar with the conditions passing through and not expecting that problem. So what you see here are is a sign that says watch for children on the upper right. And on the upper left, um, who's been to the who's been to Mill Locks for ice fishing, hunting, no? Okay, <laughs> so as you pass up 169, it's a very busy, b very busy route. What you see here in the foreground um, 
this is a reservation road within the reservation community. This is 169, which at this point is a divided highway, but is um, part of a long uh, road segment, only parts of which are segmented. This is the casino over here with a lot of travelers coming in and out in this large parking lot. This is a convenience store and also a movie theater. And so this is the grocery store that most people are using. So what you have is a large reservation community that's on this side of the highway and um, the grocery store that they use for most of their daily needs and a major employment center for many of them, which is the casino on the opposite side of the highway, no signal and people just crossing this four lane highway where the um, speed limit is 45, but where everybody will tell you that everybody is typically driving 55 or 60 miles an hour. And so we have seen and photographed, this was, um, we, we were trying to be careful about people's, uh, the confidentiality and anonymity of the subjects that we photograph because we haven't asked for their permission. But we have seen people try to get across that walking a bike um, with walkers, et cetera. And it just, it came up over and over again um, when we went to a community fair, how concerned people were about that. Um, so very heightened concerns about pedestrian safety. The other f thing that really distinguishes reservation areas from rather rural areas are these very complex jurisdictional issues of, of kind of who's responsible for the roadways and for enforcement. And so I just want to um, give you a small picture of that. There are lots of owners of what are reservation called reservation roads um, or the roads within a reservation. So what you see in this map is um, this sort of light brown or the, the slightly darkened brown area is the reservation boundaries. However, the city of Cloquet overlaps this area. Around about here is the dividing line between Carleton County and St. Louis County. There are state roads moving through this area. There are county roads, township roads, just a very complex level of roadway responsibility. And so there are people who live on the reservation who will call because there are icy conditions and they want to have it um, taken care of, who kind of get bounced around over whose jurisdiction it is, that I who it is that's supposed to come out and um, resolve that. Now in Fond du Lac, there have been some fairly positive relationships between the Fond du Lac tribal government and those other jurisdictions over sharing responsibility, trading off, whoever gets there first just deals with it. But that can't always be taken for granted. There has to be some sort of goodwill and some sort of working arrangements to do that. And for the average citizen, sometimes it's very difficult to navigate and know where it is you find help. That is true also when it comes to legal jurisdiction on enforcement. So the same story I just told about the complex web of road ownership and responsibility also applies when it comes to enforcement. So there's something called Public Law 280, which you can look up. <laughs> and um, if anybody wants to discuss it, we have a few notes that we can share with you as well. But a very complex set of rules about who is and uh, whose rules are in play for enrolled and non-enrolled tribal uh, enrolled members, non-enrolled members on reservation, on reservation when it comes to enforcement around, for example, drunk driving, speeding, driving without a license and all of those things. Um, so, you know, very recently we were interviewing a county sheriff and we said, you know, could you explain this to us? It seems very complicated. And she's like, we're also confused. Even though they navigate it constantly and she's actually quite savvy about it, it is simply a very confusing system that no doubt gets in, in the way of enforcement. Um, and in addition, there's just outright kind of disrespect for some of the tribal governments. Um, very recently, we were out at this uh, fair in Millilox where somebody told us that um, not the tribal police, but another police department had been out doing speeding enforcement and had parked by the side of the road. Somebody came flying by them. They were used to seeing people hit, you know, you see the red lights on people's cars when they see a police officer that's out doing speeding enforcement. This person just blew right through, was picked up then by this the, um, the city police officer who pursued him, was pulled over and said, oh, I didn't slow down because I thought you were the tribal police. Okay, as in, I'm not a tribal member, I'm not on the reservation, you don't have jurisdiction over me. So there's people in these areas understand when and when they are not um, subject to the law as they interpret it, and there's navigation around that that affects safety and behavior. There's also this fragmented nature of reservations. Um, this is a really noisy map. We actually debated whether to um, show this or not, because I know that it's noisy and hard to read, but actually the point is that it's noisy and it's hard to read. So I know that it may be difficult to distinguish between the red and the orange on this, um, but even if you collapse the two of them together visually, you can see that the percentage of land that would be either red, which is American Indian Trust land, or orange, which is not, is very small. 
This is from the reservation of Leech Lake in northern Minnesota, where only 4% of the land within the Leech Lake reservation area is within band ownership. And what that means, among other things, is that the villages are really dispersed. So here's Baina, here's Cass Lake, here's Walker. There are some other smaller settlements up to the north. It's about 70 miles from one end to the other. But there are children who are traveling those roads um, for up to three hours a day to get back and forth to a school where they can have, um, they, where there's an Ojibwe medium school, um, where they can learn Ojibwe and where they can feel at home in their school. So they're kids that are out on the roads a lot. And there's just a lot of issues around enforcement and um, belonging uh, between tribal and non-tribal members. When it comes to driver behavior, one of the things that we have probed is um, the question of whether drunk and drugged driving is a big explanation for what's happening in American Indian communities. And we've probed that because there's a little bit of literature to suggest that that may be what's going on, but also because it is such a commonly held popular explanation for why the there might be these elevated um, levels of fatalities and risks, that it must be because American Indians are driving drunk. Um, there isn't a lot of research to establish that, and so we have tried to probe it. It's not something that people are really comfortable talking about, um, but we have slowly been building relationships, and it is not a really prominent explanation people give for um, poor driver behavior. More often, they mention what it is that I suggested earlier, which is that they're more concerned about speeding or reckless driving um, by people from outside the area who don't anticipate seeing pedestrians um, in those space. When it comes to the use of safety restraints, which was another um, explanation we find in the literature for why the fatality rates may be higher, there's really mixed messages from, um, we've talked with safety experts, with emergency responders, with police departments um, about this, and there are very mixed messages about um, what the level of compliance is and whether there's anything distinctive in reservations and off. So this would be a really good area for additional research. So. Just to summarize, the next steps in our project are to complete our analysis of the reservation safety data, um, and we hope also to work in some non-Minnesota reservation areas. Um, also to build up kind of some research and teaching capacities on tribal governance. I know that that's not a um, transportation safety question, but it's become a real interest for us at the Humphrey School. Um, to really think about how diverse ways of knowing change how people define and respond to risk, and then really to sustain our work with these tribal governments um, to continue to provide applied and practical guidance around how we might address these issues. So thank you today. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the fact that the study was funded by the Roadway Safety Institute um, from the University Transportation Center for USDOT for our region, which covers those five states that you see there. Um, and also, uh, we want to have time now for questions and discussion, but also give you this contact information for anyone who would like to follow up. How do you do questions? Well, I can stand next to you with this microphone. And we need to have the microphone. Yep. Give Anybody have any questions? Because you need to use the microphone. Okay. Just as a reminder for those of you viewing remotely, please enter all of your questions into the chat box. Uh, let me ask a few questions. Uh, <laughs> first of all, one of the first slides talked about uh, teenagers, and I was curious, are we talking about teenage drivers? Are we talking about teenage pedestrians or teenage passengers? Uh, you know, there's a distinction between all those three components of your fatality chart. So I'm just curious, why is there such a large increase. There it is on the, all the way on the right. Yep. That is a significant difference between the other uh, uh, ethnic groups. I think it's, uh, uh, the question is good. We obtained this from the, um, in, uh, it's from a report that the CDC puts out. And unfortunately, um, we do not have a differentiation on that. And we're actually uh, probing deeper into the methodology that they used. We just used this as a way to show that there is a disparity between American Indians and other ethnic groups. 
Um, there are other uh, tables and charts that we have uh, we could have put up, but this is uh, data that is uh, relatively recent. One of the problems that we saw from the past is that um, there have been some studies that have compared um, changes over time, but they conflate all of 500 and 570 or so recognized tribes, and they were doing comparisons between 2000 and 2010, and we, we kind of questioned the methodology that they used. So this is one of the problems that we have, is that the data that we are collecting from the different uh, the reports that we're seeing, um, I believe it's, there are some areas that are incomplete, because the other thing is, when we're collecting data about American Indians, often what is happening in urban areas does not get reported. Um, it doesn't get uh, broken out properly. So are we seeing an overrepresentation of problems because we're only collecting data within the reservations and thus using that to represent all of American Indians, even though realizing that only 22% of American Indians uh, live in reservations? Oh, so this is not on tribal lands only. This is by the US population. Oh, wow. Yeah. So because when you mention, for instance, uh, uh, kids traveling to Ojibwe schools, mm -hmm. you know, and have to travel several hours. Yeah. And I'm assuming they're going by bicycle or I bus. Don't know. Hmm? Bus. By bus. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe that that's the issue that we're talking about here. I thought it might no. be no. teenage pedestrians walking on the highway. Yeah, we need to examine that data a bit more carefully. I do have something though that, that um, anecdotally what it is that we've heard from the driving teachers. Yep. <laughs> We're sorry for the noise right here. Um, anecdotally, one of the things that we have heard from uh, driving education teachers, and we need to follow up with them again now that school is back in session, um, is that they are actually not nearly so concerned about teen drivers as I would have anticipated. Um, because actually the, the rate of ownership and opportunities to drive in this population are smaller than they would be among um, American teen population and American rural population more generally. Um, but it's w one of those areas where it's important to get the perspective from on reservation and off reservation to see if there really is a distinction. So I was wondering about the signage. I saw there was one sign for just watch for children, but to me as a driver, I would think more playground, and that wouldn't really prime me that there are potentially people walking in the roadway or walking along the roadway. Are there any, um, right? So again, that's sort of, again, potentially children crossing the roadway rather than priming me to expect people to be traveling along the road. So I'm just wondering, are there any so potential solutions to to alert drivers to expect to be sharing the road in that way? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> we can both answer this. <laughs> Let me give you a little explanation about this picture. Uh, over here, we see it's a tribal road, and I'm looking at uh, the picture with the mailboxes. Um, almost to the left side of the picture is another mailbox. So even though it looks uh, uh, very woodsy, rural and stuff, there is a lot of families that live here. It's just that the, pa uh, the, the way the houses are put together gives the impression that there aren't. What happens here is that we can see even from this little bit, uh, there is very narrow shoulders, vegetation is growing on the side of the road, the driveways, thus you cannot see very well. Kids will play on the driveways, you know, they bicycle, they sled, they're trying out their new um, uh, roller skates. They're waiting for the bus for school. What usually happens in these roads is that um, um, they're used by people who might not be tribal members or might also be tribal members. And like all undivided rural roads, speeding is a huge problem, even though people live along them. Some of the solutions that have been tried are um, uh, speed bumps right, and they're not very popular, <laughs> or practical because they actually get in the way of snow plow of removals. There are many attempts that are made to calm uh, um, uh, the, uh, the speed to improve the safety, 
but uh, there's also a lack of resources. You know? I appreciate that question, though. I think it's imp it also that it's important that if you see this, and especially if part of the idea is to signal to people who don't know what normally, you know, who aren't traveling in the area a lot, that they might say, oh, that's a playground. Let me keep my eye open for the playground and not expect that people are going to be just walking around. So that's a really interesting question, actually. I hadn't thought about it quite that way. Yeah. We've certainly talked to a lot of parents, for example, in Red Lake, um, who say that kids are playing. I mean. We talked to 76 people on one morning in Red Lake at a community fair, and we must have heard 45 or 50 times that morning, kids play in the road. Kids play in the road. There's no other place to play. Kids play in the road. I run out all the time and tell my kids to get out of the road. I yell at drivers all the time to be careful of the kids. Um, you know, it, that I live in my house, and three or four times a day I hear somebody hit the brakes or mm -hmm. laying on their horn because kids are in the road and they're not moving. Um, so I, I don't know what signage you would use to get people's attention about that, but... Um, we should think about that some more. Yeah, I, I was thinking, and I, I was trying to find it and I couldn't, when I was in Ireland, that the microphone. Yeah, t give her the microphone and I'll give you this one. Yikes. Um, so when I was in <laughs> Ireland, in rural parts of Ireland, people walking in very similar roads like this was really common. And I was trying to find the sign. I feel like there was some sort of sign to alert you to expect people to be walking on the road. But I, I can't find it, so it, it could be in just my memory, but I'm thinking there may be other uh, countries that have similar problems and have come mm -hmm. up with a novel signing solution, so. So that would be a question to raise with the pedestrian safety expert who's coming next week, actually. So two signage, two weeks from now. Yeah. Um, if I wanted, <laughs> I also wanted to add that there is a problem with signs in rural areas that they get vandalized with a, in, uh, very fast, yeah, they're, very they're quickly. Great shooting target practice. Uh, this sign is in um, uh, in one of the uh, Millax uh, districts. You know, Millax is also a very spread out reservation, and I was told that this was just replaced last week because it's a popular target practice, as many signs are in rural areas, unfortunately. Here. Who else has a question, or do we have any chat questions? My question is actually about what I'm looking at. If there is a grocery store on the other side of 169 and there's a casino that employs a lot of tribal residents, why isn't there a distinct crossing for pedestrians there? I mean, it's a no-brainer, and why doesn't somebody do something about it? So here is the jurisdictional issue, too, that that's a state highway, right? Yes. Um, and so there was a plan for a pedestrian uh, overpass. There was a, a plan for a pedestrian bridge, but it was the feeling of the tribal government that it didn't really have enough safety protections for pedestrians, that there needed to be a better guardrail along the top of it. And so there was a lot of negotiation about it. And in the end, the state's response was, well, you can have all those facilities, but you'll have to pay for it. And so then they, you know, it became much more expensive and who was going to pay for this and that. And, and my point is not to demonize one side or the other, but to say that, you know, this is the same story that happens that I see as a management scholar all the time in these interjurisdictional situations where who's going to cough up the money and, and where resources are, in fact, in short supply. Can I add a little bit to yep. that? <laughs> Also, uh, one of the problems with 169, I'm sorry, I don't have a good map of it, is that um, because of uh, a pedestrian bridge has been suggested, but because of uh, rules that say that it has to be accessible, you cannot have gradients that are above six degrees, so it can be used by wheelchairs and stuff. It would put the entrance in the middle of the community that's on the side of the road. And uh, it's difficult to come up with innovative designs and pedestrian crossings. But it might be an interesting project for some design group at the university or at another university to come up with a pedestrian overpass that will be used because that's the other problem with pedestrians overpass, they're often not used, <laughs> that it will be used that can become um, uh, socially, uh, a social space and it can also serve the function of reducing pedestrian crossing on the road, but the problem is it's a very busy high-speed road. Any other questions? Well, uh, no need to keep people. I can <laughs> generate a few more questions, but no need to do that. Um, 
Thank you very much. Please <laughs> join me in thanking our speakers. It was, I found it interesting. Uh, and uh, if uh, we're all uh, done, let me thank uh, Kathy Quick and Guillermo Nervas for their interesting presentation. Uh, let me point out uh, that, uh, let me see, next week is Thanksgiving. Have I got that right? No. Let me see, the two weeks from now. Oh, I'm sorry, next week we're gonna have Piers Garter. Uh, he is from the University of Maine, and he will be talking about pedestrian safety, pedestrian behavior, and intersection design and control. So if you're interested in some of the subject matter we just talked about, uh, please tune in again next week uh, for Piers Garter, who will be uh, here at three o'clock, same time, same place, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.